Principal Component Analysis in Machine Learning. My name is Richard Kirshner with the Simply Learn team. www.simplylearn.com. Get certified, get ahead. When we talk about the principal component uh, analysis, we're going to cover dimensionality reduction, principal component analysis, what is it, important PCA terminologies, and you'll see it abbreviated uh, normally as PCA, principal component analysis, PCA properties, PCA example, and then we'll pull up some Python code in our Jupyter Notebook and have some hands-on demo on the PCA and how it's used. Dimensionality reduction. Dimensionality reduction refers to the technique that reduces the number of input variables in a data set. And so you can see on the table on the right shows the orders made at an automobile parts retailer. The retailer sells different automobile parts from different companies. And you can see we have company uh, BPACs, ISOMAX, and they have the item, the tire, the axle, an order ID, a price number, and a quantity. In order to predict the future sales, we find out that using correlation analysis that we just need three attributes. Therefore, we have reduced the number of attributes from five to three. And clearly, we don't really care about the part number. I don't think the part number would have an effect on how many tires are bought. Um, and even the store, who's buying them, probably does not have an effect on that. In this case, that's what they've actually done is remove those. And we just have the item, the tire, the price, and the quantity. One of the things you should be taking away from this is in the scheme of things, we are in the descriptive phase. We're describing the data and we're pre-processing the data. What can we do to clean it up? Why dimensionality reduction? Well, number one, less dimensions for a given data set means less computation or training time. That can be really important if you're trying a number of different models uh, and you're rerunning them over and over again. And even if you have seven gigabytes of data, that can start taking days to go through all those different models. So this is huge. This is probably the hugest part as far as reducing um, our data set. Redundancy is removed after removing similar entries from the data set. Again, pre-processing some of our models, like a neural network, if you put in two of the same data, it might give them a higher weight than they would if it was just one. So we want to get rid of that redundancy. And it also increases the processing time if you have multiple uh, data coming in. Space required to store the data is reduced. So if we're committing this into a big data uh, pool, we might not send the company that bought it. Why would we want to store two whole extra columns when we add it into that pool of data? Makes the data easy for plotting in 2D and 3D plots. This is my favorite part. Very important. You're in your shareholder meeting. You want to be able to give them a really good, um, clear, and simplified version. You want to reduce it down to something people can take in. It helps to find out the most significant features and skip the rest, which also comes in in postscribing. Uh, leads to better human interpretation. That kind of goes with number four, where it makes data easy for plotting. You have a better interpretation when we're looking at it. Principal component analysis. So what is it? Uh, principal component analysis is a technique for reducing the dimensionality of data sets, increasing interpretability, but at the same time, minimizing information loss. So we take some very complex data set with lots of variables. We run it through the PCA we reduce the variables. We end up with a reduced variable setup. This is very confusing to look at because if you look at the end result, we have the different colors all lined up. So what we're going to take a look at is let's say we have a picture here. Uh, let's say you are asked to take a picture of some toddlers and you are deciding which angle would be the best to take the picture from. So if we come up here and we look at this, we say, okay, this is you know one angle. Uh, we get the back of a lot of heads, not many faces. Uh, so we'll do it from here. We might get the one person up front smiling. A lot of the people in the class are missing, so we have um, a huge amount off to the right of blank space. Maybe from up here. Again, we have the back of someone's head. And uh, it turns out that the best angle to click the picture from might be this bottom left angle. You look at it and you say, hey, that makes sense. It's a, a good um, configuration of all the people in the picture. Now, when we're talking about data, it's not you really can't do it by what you think is going to be the best. We need to have some kind of mathematical formula so it's consistent and so it makes sense in the back end. One of the projects I worked on many years ago 
uh, has something similar to the iris. And if you've ever done the iris data set, it's probably one of the most common ones out there where they have the flower and they're measuring the stamen uh, in the petals and they have width and they have length of the petal. Instead of putting through the width and the length of the petal, we could just as easily do the um, width to length ratio. We can divide the width by the length and you get a single number where you had two. That's the kind of idea that's going on into this in pre-processing and looking at what we can do to bring the data down. A very simplified example on my uh, iris petal example. When we look at the similarity in PCA, we find the best picture or projection of the data points. And so when we look down at from one angle, we've drawn a line down there, uh, we can see these data points based on, in this case, just two variables. Now keep in mind, we're usually talking about 36, 40 variables. Um, almost all of your business models usually have about 26 to 27 different variables they're looking at. Uh, same thing with like a bank loan model. We're talking 26 to 36 different variables they're looking at that are going in. So what we want to do is we want to find the best view. In this case, we're just looking at the XY. We look down at it, and we have our second um, idea, PC2. And again, we're looking at the XI, this XY, this time from a different direction. Here, for our ease, we can consider that we get two principal components, namely PC1 and PC2. Comparing both the principal components, we find the data points are sufficiently spaced in PC1. So if you look at what we got here, we have uh, PC1. You can see along the line how the data points are spaced versus the spacing in PC2. And that's what they're coming up with. What is going to give us the best look for these data points when we combine them? And we're looking at them from just a single angle. Whereas in PC2, they are less spaced, which makes the observation and further calculations much more difficult. Therefore, we accept the PC1 and not the PC2 as the data points are more spaced. Now, obviously, the back-end calculations are a little bit more complicated when we get into the math of how they decide what is more valuable. This gives you an idea, though, that when we're talking about this, we're talking about the perspective, uh, which would help in understanding how PCA analysis works. What we want to go ahead and do is dive into the important terminologies under uh, PCA. And important terminologies are views, the perspective through which data points are observed. And so you'll hear that if someone's talking about a PCA presentation and they're not taking the time to reduce it to something you, that the average person, shareholders can understand, you might hear them refer to it as the different views. What view are we taking? Dimension, number of columns in a data set are called the dimensions of that data set. And we talked about, uh, you'll hear features, dimensions. Um, I was talking about features, there's usually when you're running a business, you're talking 25, 26, 27 different features, minimal. And then you have the principal component, new variables that are constructed as linear combinations or mixtures of the initial variables. Principal component is very important. It's a combination. If you remember my flower example, it would be the width over the length of the petal as opposed to putting both width and length in. You just put in the um, ratio instead, which is a single number versus two separate numbers. Projections. The perpendicular distance between the principal component and the data points. And that goes to that line we had earlier. It's that right angle line of where those point, how all those points fall onto the line. Important properties. Important properties. Number of principal components is always less than or equal to the number of attributes. That just makes common sense. Uh, you're not going to do 10 principal properties with only three features. Uh, you're trying to reduce them, so it's just kind of goofy, but it is important to remember that. People will throw weird code out there and just randomly do stuff with, instead of really thinking it through. Principal components are orthogonal. And this is what we're talking about, that right angle from the line. When we, when we do PC1, we're looking at how those points fall on to that line. Uh, same thing with PC2. And we want to make sure that PC1 does not equal PC2. We don't want to have the same two principal points uh, when we do two points. The priority of principal components decreases as their numbers increase. This is important to understand. If you're going to create uh, one principal component, 
everything is summarized into that one component. As we go to two components, the priority, um, how much it holds value decreases as we go down. So if you have five different points, each one of those points is going to have less value than just the one point, which has everything summarized in it. How PCA works. I said there was more in the back end when we talk about the math. This is what we're talking about is how does it actually work. So now we have understanding that you're, you're looking at a perspective. Uh, now we want to see how that math side works. PCA performs the following operations in order to evaluate the principal components for a given data set. First we start with the standardization. Then we have a covariance matrix computation. And we use that to generate our iGene vectors and iGene values, which is the feature vector. And if you remember, the iGene vector is like a translation for um, uh, moving the data from x equals 1 to x equals 2 or whatever, altering it. And the iGene value is the final value that we generate. When we talk about standardization, the main aim of this step is to standardize the range of the attributes so that each one of them lie within similar boundaries. This process involves removal of the mean from the variable values and scaling the data with respect to the standard deviation. And you can see here we have z equals the variable values minus the mean over the standard deviation. The covariance matrix computation. Covariance matrix is used to express the correlation between any two or more attributes in multi-dimensional data set. The covariance matrix has the entries as the variance and the covariance of the attribute values. The variance is denoted by var and the covariance is denoted by cov. On the right we can see the covariance matrix for two attributes and their values. When we do a hands-on look at the code, we'll do a display of this so you can see what we're talking about and what that looks like. For now, you can just notice that this is a matrix that we're generating with the variance and then the covariance of x to y. On the right side, we can see the covariance table for more than two attributes in a multi-dimensional data set. And this is what I was talking about. We usually are looking at uh, not just one feature or two features. We're usually looking at 25, 30 features going on. And so if we do a setup like this, we should see all those different features as the different variables. Covariance matrix tells us how the two or more variables are related. Positive covariance indicate that the value of one variable is directly proportional to the other variable. Negative covariance indicate that the value of one variable is inversely proportional to the other variable. That is always important to note when whenever we're doing any of these matrices that we're going to be looking at that positive and negative, whether it's inverted or not. And then we have the iGene values and the iGene vectors. iGene values and iGene vectors are the mathematical value that are extracted from the covariance table. They are responsible for the generation of a new set of variables from the old set of variables, which further lead to the construction of the principal components. IGene vectors do not change directions after linear transformation. IGene values are the scalars or the magnitude of the IGene vectors. And again, this is just transforming that data. So we're going to change uh, the vector b to the b prime as denoted on the chart. And so when we have like multiple variables, how do we calculate that new variable? And then we have feature vectors. Feature vectors is simply a matrix that has iGene vectors of the components that we decide to keep as the columns. Here we decide whether we must keep or discard the less significant principal components that we have generated in the above steps. This becomes really important as we start looking at uh, the back end of this, and we'll do this in the demo, uh, but one of the more important steps to understand. And so we have the PCA example, consider matrix X with N rows or observations and K columns or variables. Now for this matrix, we would construct a variable space with as many dimensions as the variable. But for our simplicity, let's consider this three dimensions for now. Now each observation, row of the matrix X, is placed in the K dimensional variable space, such that the rows in the data table form a swarm of points in this space. Now we find the mean of all the observations and then place it along the data points on the plot. 
The first principal component is a line that best accounts for the shape of the point swarm. It represents a maximal variance direction in the data. Each observation may be projected onto this line in order to get a coordinate value along the PC1. This value is known as a score. Usually only one principal component is insufficient to model the systematic variation for a data set. Thus a second principal axis is created. The second principal component is oriented such that it reflects the second largest source of variation in the data. While being orthogonal to PC1, PC2 also passes through the average point. Let's go ahead and pull this up and just see what that means uh, inside our Python scripting. I'm going to use the Anaconda Navigator and I will be in Python 3.6 for this example. I believe there's even like a 3.9 out. I tend to stay in 3.6 because a lot of the models I use, especially with the neural networks, are stable in 3.6. And then we open up our uh, Jupyter. I'm in Chrome. And we go ahead and create a new Python 3. And for ease of use, uh, our team in the back was nice enough to put this together for me. And we'll go ahead and start with the libraries. The first thing I like to do whenever I'm looking at any new setup, uh, well, you know what, let's do, let's do the libraries first. We're going to do our basic libraries, which is matplot library, uh, the PLT from the matplot library, pandas, our data frame, uh, pd, numpy, our numbers array, np, seaborn for graphing, sns, that goes with the plot that actually sits on matplot library, so the seaborn sits on there. And then we have our amber sign because we're in Jupyter Notebook, matplot library in line. The newer version actually doesn't require that, um, but I put it in there either anyway just because I'm so used to it. And then we want to go ahead and take a look at the data. And in this case, we're going to pull in, uh, certainly you can have lots of fun with different data, but we're going to use the cancer data set. Um, and one of the reasons the cancer data set is, is it has like 36, 35 different features. So it's kind of fun to use that as our base for this. Then we'll go ahead and run this and look at our keys. And the first thing we notice in our keys for the cancer data set uh, is we have our data, we have our target, our frame, target names, description, feature names, and file name. So what we're looking for in all this is, um, well, let's take a look at the description. Let's go in here and pull up the description on here. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on the description um, because this is we don't want to get into a medical domain. We want to focus on our PCA setup. Uh, what's important is you start looking at what the different attributes are, what they mean. Um, if you were in the medical field, you'd want to note all these different things, whether what they're measuring, where it's coming from. You can actually see the actual different um, measurements they're taking. No missing attributes. We page all the way to the bottom, and you're going to have your data, in this case our target, and if you dig deep enough to the target, uh, let's actually do this, let's go ahead and print target names, real quick here, I always like to, to just take a look and see what's on the other end of this, uh, target names. Run that. And so the target name is, is it malignant or is it benign? Um, so in other words, is this a dangerous growth or is it something we don't have to worry about? That's the bottom line with the cancer in this case. And then we can go ahead and load our data. And uh, you know what, let me go up a, just a notch here for easy of reading. It's hard to get that just right. I guess I'll have to do. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at our data. Uh, our, our, we're going to use our pandas, and we're going to go ahead and uh, do our data frame. It's going to equal cancer data. Columns equals cancer. Feature equals feature names. So remember up here, we already loaded the, the uh, names up of, our, of the features in there. What is going to come out of this? Let me just see if we can get to that. It's at the top of target names. Um, that's just this list of names here in the setup. 
then we can go ahead and run this code and it'll print the head and you can see here we have the mean radius the mean texture mean perimeter I don't know about you this is a wonderful data set if you're playing with it because like many of the data that most of the data that comes in half the time we don't even know what we're looking at uh, we're just handed a bunch of stuff as a data scientist going what the heck is this and so this is a good place to start because this has a number of different features in there and we have no idea what these feature means or where they come from we want to just look at the data and figure that out and now we actually are getting into the PCA side of it as we've noticed before it's difficult to visualize high dimensional data we can use PCA to find the first two principal components and visualize the data this new two-dimensional space with a single scatter plot uh, before we do this we need to go ahead and scale our data now I haven't run this to see if you really have to scale the data on this um, but as just a general runtime, I almost do that as the first step of any modeling, even if it's pre-modeling as we're doing here. Um, in neural networks, that is so important. With PCA visualization, it's already going to scale it when we do the means and deviation inside the PCA. Uh, but just in case, it's always good to scale it. And then we're going to take our uh, PCA with the scikit-learn uses very similar process to other pre-processing functions that come with scikit-learn. We instantiate a PCA object, find the principal components using the fit method, then apply the rotation and dimensionality reduction by calling transform. We can also specify how many components we want to keep when creating the PCA object. And so the code for this Oops, getting a little bit ahead. <laughs> Let me go ahead and run this code. Uh, so the code for this is from sklearn decomposition import PCA. PCA equals PCA and components equals two. And that's really important to note that because uh, we're only going to want to look at two components. I would never go over four components, uh, especially if you're going to demo this with somebody else. If you're showing this to the shareholders, the whole idea is to reduce it to something people can see. Uh, and then the PCA fit, we're going to, uh, is going to take the scaled data that we generated up here. And then you can see we've created our PCA model with in components equals two. Now, whenever I use a new tool, I like to go in there and actually see what I'm using. So let's go to the scikit uh, web page for the PCA. And you can see in here, here's our call statement. It describes what all the different uh, setups you have on there. Probably the biggest one to look at would be, um, well, the biggest one is your components. How many components do you want, uh, which you have to put in there pretty much. And then you also might look at the SVD solver. It's on auto right now, but you can override that and do different things with it. It does a pretty good job as it is. And if we go down all the way down to um, here we go to our methods if you notice we have fit and we have fit transform nowhere in here is predict because this is not a, used for prediction uh, it's used to look at the data again we're in the describe setup we're fitting the data we're taking a look at it uh, we've already looked at our minimum maximum we've already looked at what's in each quarter we've done a full description of the data this is part of describing the data um, that's the biggest thing i take away when i come zooming in here and of course they have examples of it down here if you forget um, and the biggest one of course is the number of components and then uh, i mean the rest you can play with um, the actual solver whether you're doing a full or randomized there's different things it is pretty good on the auto and now we can transform this data to its first two principal components and so we have our um, XPCA we're going to set that equal to PCA transform scaled data uh, so there we go there's our first transformation and let's just go ahead and print the scaled data shape and the XPCA data shape. And the reason we want to do this is just to show us uh, what's going on here. 
we've taken 30 features. I think I said 36 or something like that, but it's 30. And we've compressed it down to two features. And we decided we wanted two features, and that's where this comes from. Uh, we still have 569 data sets. I mean data rows, not data sets. We still have 569 rows of data, but instead of computing 30 features, we're now only doing our model on two features. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, plot these and take a look and see what's going on. And uh, we're just going to use our PLT figure. We're going to set the figure size on here. Here's our scatter plot, um, XPCA, X underscore PCA of, uh, of 1. These are our two different perceptions we're using. Uh, and then you'll see right here, C for color, cancer equals target. And so remember we have 0, we have 1. And if I remember correctly, 0 was malignant, 1 was B9. Uh, so everything in the zero column is going to be one color, and the other color is going to be one. And then we're going to use the plasma map, just kind of telling you what color it is. Add some labels, first principal component, second principal component. And we'll go ahead and run this. And you can see here, instead of having a chart, one of those heat maps with 30 different columns in it, we can look at this and say, hey, this one actually did a pretty good job of separating the data. And a couple things when I'm looking at this that I notice is first, we have a very clear area where it's clumped together, um, where it's going to be benign. And we have a huge area, it's still clumped together, more spread out, where it's going to be uh, malignant. Or I think I had that backwards. And then in the middle, because we're dealing with something, in this particular case, cancer, we would try to separate, I would be exploring how to separate this middle group out. In other words, there's an area where everything overlaps and we're not going to have a clear result on it. Uh, just because those are the people you want to go in there and have extra tests or treat it differently versus going in and saying just cutting into the, can into the cancer so that the body absorbs it and it dissipates versus uh, actively going in there, removing it, testing it, going through chemo and all the different things. That's a big difference, you know, as far as what's going to happen here. And that middle line where they overlap is going to be huge. That's domain specific. Uh, going back to the data, we can see here, uh, clearly by using these two components, we can easily separate these two classes. So the next step is what does that mean? Interpreting the components. Unfortunately, with this great power of dimensionality reduction comes the cost of not being able to easily understand what these components represent. I don't know what principal component one looks, or represents or second principle. The components correspond to combinations of original features. The components themselves are stored as an attribute of the filtered PCA object. And so when we talk, look at that, we can go ahead and do uh, look at the PCA components. This is in our model we built. We've trained it. We can run that, and you can see here's the actual components. Uh, it's the two components have each have their own array. And within the array, you can see the, uh, what the scores they're using. And these actually give weight to what features are doing what. So in this NumPy matrix array, each row represents a principal component, and each column relates back to the original features. What's really neat about this is we can now go in reverse and drop this onto a heat map and start seeing uh, what this means. And so let me go ahead and just put this down. Oops, I already got it down here. Uh, we'll go ahead and put this in here. We're going to use our um, DF comp data frame, and we do our PCA components. And I want you to notice how easy this is. Uh, we're going to set our columns equal to cancer feature names. That just makes it really easy. And we're dumping it into a data frame. What's neat about a data frame is when we get to Seaborn, it will pull that data frame apart and, uh, and set it up for us what we want. And so we're just going to do the, C the Seaborn heat map of our data frame uh, composition, and we'll use the plasma coloring. And it creates a nice little color graph here. You can see we have the mean radius and all the different features along the bottom. 
On the right, uh, we have a scale. So we can see we have the dark colors all the way to the really light colors, which are what's really shining there. This is like the primary stuff we want to look at. So this heat map and the color bar basically represent the correlation between the various features and the principal component itself. So, you know, very powerful map to look at. And then you can go in here and we might notice that the mean radius, look how, how on the bottom of the map it is um, on some of this. Uh, so you have some interesting correlations here that change the variations on that and what means what. This is more when you get to uh, uh, postscribe, you can also use this to try to guess as what these things mean and what you want to change to get a better result. And that wraps it up for principal component analysis in machine language. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.